Hey, everybody, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Friday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers have capped off a winless preseason, but Russell Westbrook played his best game. LeBron looked totally dominant. So what do we know about the Lakers now that we didn't know when this all started? We'll talk about that next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Want to thank everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day. Monday through Friday, we get this thing up in the wee hours of the morning, so it's there for you whenever you might need it. Um, and, of course, Locked On Lakers on YouTube, where you can get all the breaking news, stuff that can't quite wait for a podcast, and, of course, especially on uh, non-game nights, the podcast a little bit early so thank you everybody for for helping us out with that we really appreciate all the support and it's been great and we're having a great time um speaking of great times andy you said on tuesday's show that you much preferred an zero and six preseason than some sort of wimpy you know uh, limp one and five kind of thing and uh the lakers and frank vogel apparently agree with you yeah frank vogel like in the last Four or five minutes of the game, he actually, and this this game was tight. He yes, actually they, had, they absolutely had a chance to, at the very least, play LeBron, uh, play Davis and Westbrook. I think LeBron had taken his shoes off at that point, but like you could have played some starters down the stretch of this game. Uh, no, 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 not no, no, no. At that point, it was uh, Austin Reeves. You know, obviously one of the core members of his this team, but then. Like traveling queen and you know a bunch of guys that may or may not end up on the roster or who knows what their G League futures are going to be. But Frank Vogel recognized one in five. That's just doing a bad job in the preseason. Nobody cares about that. Zero oh, and six. That is glorious. That yes. gives you something to talk about. That gives you fear going back mm-hmm. to the this is going to be fun season where they were zero oh and eight. Yes, spoiler death. alert. It was not. <laughs> yeah, you had Kobe giving the death stare to Mike Brown. Like or. It gives you something to say, all right, we hear everything you're saying. We know you're talking about the winless Lakers, the wash Lakers, the team that's going to collapse, whatever. Either way, 0-6 is glorious drama. 1-5 and is you just crap the bed. Yeah. Sports, clearly Frank Vogel loves his sports radio. There's nothing more important to him than that. Um, Look, I mean, Russell Westbrook summed it up very well after the game when he was asked, like, what what if anything does this mean what can you take from from the record and he said i've played for however many years 13 14 years i cannot tell you what my preseason record is um and that is true and lebron has said multiple times throughout the preseason that he will learn nothing uh in the preseason he's just not because you know he's 19 years in and he's lebron james and all that kind of stuff. So there's stuff that they want to work on and stuff that they want to yeah, do i mean I, but I like think- in terms of like reading into results reading into stuff which is i think what he's getting at um that's not the point you know he played two games correct lebron did LeBron? the three of that lebron played two or three the three of them together played two um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, the, it, it's not one for drawing conclusions that said, um, this was, let's draw some conclusions. Yes. Let's, let's jump to a bunch of wild ones. This was, cause I want to talk a little bit about, it, it, we can't project, um, you know, I think in the next segment we'll get to this, but like, we can't project, like, are they more or less likely to win the finals? That's stupid. I do think you can get an, an idea for maybe recalibrating expectations for the first 10 or 15 games, which is something I want to talk about before we're done here. Um, But overall, LeBron played a great game. He looked, you know, strong. He looked dominant. He was able to get in the paint whenever he wanted, finished with 30 points, six rebounds, six assists, uh, 12, 20 from the floor in 29 minutes. And Westbrook, and I think this is even much, even more significant, had his best game in the preseason, 18 points, a very controlled seven of 12 from the floor, had five assists, three steals, looked good. Um, th- to see those two guys play well and then Davis continue to play aggressively, couldn't hit a shot, but pl- continued to play very aggressively. This was the best the big three looked in the preseason by a mile. 
Yeah, you got a real sense that Westbrook in particular was going to have a really good game. The first possession for the Lakers, he got to the basket and really worked his way in methodically, but really strong. You could tell that he felt confident looking to overpower whoever was going to be on him. Next possession, he ended up uh, getting fouled while driving against uh, De'Aaron Fox uh, out of the de- out of the uh, dead ball. He inbounded, then cut and got fed by LeBron for a layup. Um, he ended up hitting a, uh, an elbow jumper, which I've always thought over the years is sort of his, I don't want to say heat check because this was a night where he only took 12 shots. So it's not right. like he was really looking to see if he could feel it. But that's a, that to me has always felt like a Russell Westbrook is confident in his shooting shot. And there uh-huh. have been times over the years where it has been his heat check shot. But either way, though, it feels indicative to me of when things are going well for Westbrook. And then th- there was this incredible sequence between him and DeAndre Jordan off a of pick and roll where they were just, they started high, high pick and roll and just working their way towards the basket, mm-hmm. touch passing back and forth. Give, it was a getting, give and go with a second give and go right after. Yeah. And it eventually led to DeAndre getting a bucket and just this, this was Russell Westbrook looking as comfortable as we've seen him mm-hmm. as a Laker, like beyond, beyond the energy, beyond the efficiency, beyond how well he played, he just looked comfortable. Like, this was the first game where Russell Westbrook, like, we've talked about this before, Brian. Like, this is, Westbrook has heard everything that people have said about why this won't work. And this is, you know, a new relationship for Russell Westbrook with this team. And, you know, anybody who's ever been in a relationship, like a real life relationship, but, you know, whether you're talking about significant other, whether you're talking about work, whatever, you always start out on your absolute best behavior, looking to make the best impression, overcompensating a lot of different things. Then, you know, as the relationship builds and it starts getting better and you can start being yourself, you feel more comfortable, you know, letting out the worst sides of Shirts you. Shirts untucked. Dishes yeah, exactly. Done. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, you. you start doing things you, that make you forget you wonder. to lift the toilet seat. Like things right. happen. You do all the things that make you wonder why your significant other or your boss still has you around. Yes. But, you know, Westbrook, I feel like, you know, he still obviously is looking to have a great impression on, on this team. And, you know, he's one of the most important players, you know, the Lakers have this season. But this felt like the first game where he wasn't trying to please his significant other's parents. You right. know what I mean? Like which, you, which was the just reason for a lot of the turnovers that he was – were yeah. these like just trying to make a play that didn't need to be made, that was too difficult, that was unnecessary. And I mean, what the, the, the play you described with DeAndre, and I'm sure people, you know, Lakers fans especially, I'm sure have seen this on social by now. Um, but like you forget it's, – it's really funny it, because – you know, you think of Harden, you think of LeBron, you think of Chris Paul and some Trey Young, I think is starting to get into like really slick, just great passers, guys who make, you know, you know, these like holy bleep LaMelo ball, LaMelo ball starting to just put up a ton of these things for a guy who averages over 10 assists a game in like five of the last six years or whatever the number is. I don't. I don't think of Russ as like in that category in my head when I when I think of Russ, I'm not saying it's fair, but like of the and like little plays like he made with DeAndre um, on that, like are a real reminder, like the guy is like you can't pile up those kinds of numbers without being a really good passer. It's not stylish in some well, ways wh- that, here's is, the thing. that some of these point guards do, but. It is he is he is capable of making excellent excellent passes, and I think what's really important too here, and I, I, and, I, and 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 then you know jump in the Lakers. That was a moment where the Lakers were doing it in tight quarters, and they've had a bunch of that over the course of the preseason. Um, almost like, and that's where some, uh, some of the other turnovers are going because the speed of those passes isn't quite calibrated right. But you know the Lakers have run a lot of little inside plays out of the high post dribble handoffs and stuff like that tight quarters passing inside is going to be a big part of this, of this team's game. And to have guys 
like Westbrook, LeBron is obviously very capable of it. Even Reeves showed a little bit of capability of that and, and making those plays. It's going to be because the spacing issues are real. The ability to move the ball in tight space is going to be very important. They did it pretty well, I thought, on on uh, Thursday. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately what you're talking about with Russ, because everybody knows he's a great passer. But you understand? But you but, kind of understand what well, I mean. I, what, I, I, what I think. I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I think what it is, and, and you use the word slick when you were talking specifically about Trey Young, but some of the other guys that you mentioned, there is a certain slickness at times to their games. Russell Westbrook is not a slick player because no. slick in a lot of ways implies subtlety or things that sneak up on you. And there is right. absolutely nothing Russell Westbrook does that sneaks up on anybody. He may be <laughs> the least subtle player, not just in the league right now. No, like, like ever. He, yeah, Ever. he's top five. He is like top five NBA history in terms of just not subtle when he's on the court. So I, I think at times when you see things that just feel, for lack of a better way of putting it, soft, like, you know, like the literal softness that comes with touch passing. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. let's be honest. I didn't know DeAndre. <laughs> I mean, if we're, no, we're really was, DeAndre, by the way, yeah, we don't have to spend a ton of time on this. Well, I'm sure we'll probably get to the lineup a little bit in the show. He looked good. Like he yeah. played. This was the best he looked in the preseason. Yep. In terms of effectiveness on on both sides, you know, imperfect, but like he's DeAndre Jordan, folks. We're not, but like they 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 looked good with him in the starting lineup. They played pretty well. They you know they did not suffer when he was in the game. No, absolutely not. I mean, we're we're gonna get into I. We're going to get into elements of DeAndre Jordan with the the lineup and also just something I want to mention in terms of DeAndre Jordan for the season because yes. we're we're seeing a trend just in the preseason and I want to knock this shit off because it's going to get really old really fast. We'll talk about that later on in the show. Yeah, I did the last point on Russ and we'll go to the break here, but like I I I think you're right, the subtlety aspect of it does, but there's a, there's another part of it that I think is related to the basic knock on Westbrook, and this is not my knock, um, but many do my knocks. <laughs> um, the Empire Strikes Back; those are the things that eat the cables on the Millennium. Planet. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and it's it's that the, the knock on Russ in a lot of ways is he has the ball in his hands so damn much that he just piles up numbers. And he piles up assists because he's constantly got the ball in his hands, never gives it up. And if you always have the ball in your hands, you always are dribbling like that, and you're always like you're gonna get assists. It's a stupid argument. I don't think you can average an empty triple double for years on end. Like I just don't buy that argument. Um, well, I mean, but as opposed I, to Chris Paul, who racks up assists but never has the ball in his hands. I mean, he, but, Chris, but but then then again, it's a style thing. He I mean, plays like it's point. LeBron guard has the ball in his hands all the time. Steve, I, you know, Steve Nash was like one of the most unselfish players. But I'm not. I, I didn't say the no, argument. No, no, no. Was I know smart. that. I'm, but it, you know, it exists. When it no, comes no, no. To I us. understand that. I'm just saying, like, in terms of the way we think about this stuff. And again, I think a lot of this just has to do with the noisiness of Russell Westbrook. Mm-hmm. All of these guys that you mentioned have the ball in Constantly. their hands a lot. Like, you right. know, Magic defined NBA unselfishness. He was not some off-ball player. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, Little Magic was not ripped. Right, I just, I, it, it, it is a reminder. Like, this is the, the fun that comes with being able to watch guys up close for multiple games in a row. Like, I, it, when LeBron showed up, it was not the first time I'd watched LeBron James play basketball. Watching him live for a season and then another season. And it's different. You see him up close at practice. It's different. And, you know, I, I'm looking forward to that with Russ. And it's just, just that play was a reminder of like, yeah, he's not, ju- you know, it's not pretty in the same way that LaMelo Ball or Magic or, you know, Chris Paul or these like point guardiest of point guards make plays. But man, the guy can really pass. Um, let's talk, though, a little bit about what's coming. Because I do think while you can't necessarily um, judge where the Lakers are going all season long on the preseason, that would be dumb. You can look a little bit ahead based on what we've seen from the lineups and based on what we've seen from the defense at what the first 10 or 15 games could look like. And that does have a significant impact on the season. Let's talk about that next. First, though, Andy, you're an NBA fanatic, right? Yes. Have you heard about prize picks? 
No, it's a daily fantasy league that's made a daily fantasy that's made easy for you. I love Prize Picks. I know you're going to love Prize Picks. It has all the best NBA DFS prop games on the market. It offers more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator, and offers all the superstar players, all the bench players, only recording a handful of minutes here and there. Every prop that you can think of, and if you use the promo code and you make your deposit, you use the promo code, you receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 if you use the promo code NBA. Here's how you do it. You pick two to five players and an over-under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry, and it's just you versus the numbers. It's not you versus some other guy, another person over there. It's just you and numbers. It's your ta- If you hate analytics, you hate numbers, this is the game for you. You can just attack the numbers. It's like Screw Zach Galifianakis in uh, the, the Hangover when all those exactly. numbers are just swirling around him. That's the game you're playing. That's the game. It allows mixed sport entries. You can take the over on LeBron combined with the under on Mahomes in the same entry. That's kind of fun. Where else can you do that? And the award-winning, award-winning app, uh, it, it's on both the App Store and on Google Play. So... Uh, uh, entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Prize Picks, it's safe. It offers fast withdrawals. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com. Use the promo code NBA or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Um, the Obviously, Andy, most of us has, have been uh, pushing for DeAndre Jordan to not be the starting center for the Los Angeles Lakers, and it would be uh, Anthony Davis starting there, playing the majority of the minutes. Jordan plays um, kind of Dwight's backup role. That's essentially what he would do here. The Lakers went small on Tuesday. They went big on Thursday. Um, Probably looked a little better on Thursday than they did on Tuesday. I'm not sure that's DeAndre Jordan. He only played 15 minutes. Um, But Dwight got some, some real run. Where it stands now, maybe the Golden State game is not the best one to look at just because they're weird. But overall, over these first 10 or 15 games, do you expect the Lakers to start a traditional center when it's all said and done? I guess particularly, too, now you have to think about who isn't available. Yeah, I was going to say, I I honestly have no idea because Frank Vogel had been signaling that he might have been going small again for Thursday because when he was asked about whether or not he would do um, a big lineup, he said not necessarily and you know, there there had been some, it felt like leanings towards AD at the five, you know, and, you know, he he's made it, he had made it very clear or had, you know, at least presented the idea that the injuries that the Lakers have been dealing with wasn't pushing him in a lineup direction size-wise one way or the other. I, I honestly can't get a beat on this. And it's in, you know, they open against Golden State. Golden State is not a team that would necessarily – require a guy of DeAndre's size to start. The next game is against Phoenix. If they ended up starting DeAndre, you could look at it and say, well, he's up against DeAndre Ayton. So th- that leads to the size Maybe, issue. Yeah, so, yeah. so those two games in and of itself could be the complete opposite lineups without giving you real indication one way or the other. Right. You together, know, he, Just as a frame of reference, together DeAndre and, and Dwight played 28 minutes. Um against the Kings it might have been a little bit more in a normal game or if Dwight hadn't almost fouled out in those 13 (laughs) minutes yeah um packed a lot in as we've said dial it back a little bit Dwight dial it back he Um, Dwight is really leaning into the idea of energy like I think I I think like he is starting to equate just all energy is positive energy, and he wants to look like he is always putting out the positivist energy of all time. Like, like he wants he wants to go down like in in the Hall of Fame as the most positive player to ever put on a uniform. And there are times where it feels like that energy uh, he's not even capable of harnessing at all. That and the fact that he's just getting older and he just can't do as much without fouling. And yeah. I mean, he's. Last season with Philadelphia for 36 minutes, he averaged six fouls on the nose with the Lakers during the championship season, 6.1. So <laughs> this is you, not a recent trend. Right. Well, yeah. I was going to say, like, you could be tempted to look at what's happening and say, well, it's the preseason. He doesn't care. No, no, no this no, is what happens Dwight. in the games yeah, where he cares. Dwight. And, and so, again, dial it back. But, um, you know, those guys played 28 minutes combined, which leaves AD at the five, you know, 
for some of those other, you know, that's essentially, you know, the other minutes that he's playing, you know, but, you know, I, I agree with you. It's, it's really hard to figure out how this is going to go. He said he wants a consistent starting lineup. So I think if you, if you assume that the three guys, Ellington and Monk and Nunn would be available, which does change things up a little bit in terms of what your rotation looks like and how guys fit in. Um, you know, a lineup that they saw on Tuesday with Bazemore and and Mello certainly seems like a very real possibility, but I, I don't know either. Um, what do you what do you expect though from those first fifteen or so games? Because the Lakers open as they almost always do, Andy, with a very home heavy schedule, relatively soft in terms of the teams that they're going to see, um, high end playoff teams and and stuff like that. They certainly have an opportunity based on the schedule to get off to a good start. And my inclination was looking back at how they started last year, which was stronger, I think, than people expected. Looking back at how they started two years ago, which was way stronger than people expected after the opener. Um, I, I was kind of thinking they would do the same thing. The one lesson I think I have taken from the preseason is I don't know if they're going to be good enough yet. I don't think they have enough defensive continuity. And unless the big three are really clicking either as individuals or the group kind of comes together a little bit more, I don't know if the offense is going to be quite good enough because it wasn't great on... I mean, they look kind of individually good, but the offense as a whole had a lot of dead moments on Thursday, even with this being their best game together. Yeah, I mean, it, what what gives me comfort is I think the last couple games, they result aside, they've been getting better, and the big three together has been looking more uh, more fluid, and it, you can see that Russ and LeBron and AD they have really recognized just how much pressure they can put on defenses the closer they get to the basket. And they are being relentless about that. You know, Frank Vogel talked after the the loss to Sacramento on Thursday about the idea of during this preseason, they've been playing to exhaustion when it comes to pace. And that's actually what they're asking of these guys. And the idea being they want to really get themselves physically, mentally up to the task of running all the time. So once they start doing this in the regular season – it really becomes second nature See, I, I, from a I, I conditioning even, standpoint. I, I took it even a step further than that, Andy. I think they want to be able to build, because he said he wants that to continue. They want to keep that yeah. up like, where every every game they run to exhaustion so that the next game they can come back and be stronger to sure. run more. Yeah. And it's so I, I like, but the idea that they could be not just prepared to run, you know, in the regular season, okay, this is how we're going to play, but to actually make that a kind of a mission statement to be able to get stronger and stronger and stronger so that by the end of the year, they're actually able to run more and more effectively, perhaps even than they are at the beginning of it. That to me was really interesting as a framing for how this team wants to improve and wants to operate. You know, that wasn't necessarily, they they pushed, I thought, early, especially in, on Tuesday's game, they pushed early, very aggressively into the lane on Thursday. Um, but that's not so much what we've seen on the floor as it's really a a revelation from Vogel of where we want to go. I thought that was incredibly interesting. Yeah. I mean, look, these guys have talked a ton about looking to run, and the Lakers were at their best during the championship season when they were in transition. Their offense in the half court was, you know, really, really unreliable. They're there were times where you could get by just because LeBron can make so many different things happen. Anthony Davis is one of the most talented players in the league, particularly that season. And the role players at times did just enough, but you know their three-point shooting was extremely erratic. And we saw from last year when they didn't run as much or as effectively, they need to get back to that, particularly when you bring in a guy like Russell Westbrook. Yeah, I mean, got, there, yeah. There's no point to doing this unless you're going to be picking up that pace you know, defensively, like they're they're definitely not there yet. And Frank Vogel's talked about that basically after every practice, after every game. Talked about it after this game. You know, there there were a few sequences after DeAndre had got gone out and Anthony Davis was the center in the first half, where you could see Sacramento was running high pick and roll after high pick and roll, like out starting at the three point arc, 
because they knew they were drawing Anthony Davis's guy. Like, like they were doing right. this they, specifically. There's, there's no, they were taking the rim protection away. Right. It, well, but it's not just that they were taking away the rim protection. Like they, it, they were. But I, I think it was, you know, specifically they're drawing, they're using a big to draw Anthony Davis out to out towards mm-hmm. a three point line. But they were also really counting on the idea that the Lakers pick and roll coverage from there was going to be completely screwed. Right. That, what I mean, what I, what I meant just by that is like you know the 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 ability for guys to recover into space. You have a lot more open space to work with, and the Lakers just aren't able to coordinate. Yeah, how I to mean, deal with that. They, they were doing this over and over, yes. and it was very clear very after a while. Like you know, Tristan, Tom, you know, Tristan Thompson rolling to the basket. Obviously, you got to account for him. He ain't that good. Is Tristan Thompson? Yeah. Um, so okay, uh, when we come when we come back from the break, we'll we'll finish this. Like, what do you think they look like? You know, what what kind of record do you think? Have you changed your, you know, recalibrated what you think the record could be after the first two or three weeks of the season, and whether or not that ultimately makes that much of an impact? And then Andy, Hillbilly Kobe is making it impossible for us to not talk about Hillbilly Kobe. Had some really impressive moments from Thursday's game, and Frank Vogel says he has earned his trust. We're going to talk some Hillbilly Kobe next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Theragun. Don't let the stress of daily life weigh on your body. Whether you're an elite athlete or somebody like me, an elite podcaster, just trying to get through the day tension-free, Theragun can help. Theragun is the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension while using scientifically calibrated combinations of depth, speed, and power, again, like elite athletes or elite podcasters Uh while as quiet as an electric toothbrush the gen 4 theragun gets to the source of the pain by releasing tension using theragun's signature percussion percussive therapy which gives 60 percent deeper than the vibration alone the theragun app even learns of your behavior and suggests guided routines we have one of these at our house at theragun my god this is a game changer. It, it is it, awesome. It so Theragun good. is trusted by 250 professional sports teams like Real Madrid, elite athletes like Paul George, DeAndre Hopkins, Maria Sharapova, thousands of customers, and again, elite podcasters like myself. So try Theragun. Every night days. after a show, Andy takes the Theragun and just hits his face with it over and over again to make sure his, he doesn't like have soreness in his jaw afterwards. Right, and then or, I remember that's actually not how you use it, just hitting yourself over and over with no, the No, but you gun. turn it on. It's like... Well, now you tell me. Yeah. Uh, Theragun for 30 games, uh, thirty days, starting at just 199 bucks. So go to theragun.com slash locked on right now. Get your Gen 4 Theragun today. Again, theragun.com slash locked on. Theragun.com slash locked on. Locked on Lakers also brought to you by Built Bar. If you're like me, Andy, you not hitting your, you know, using your your Theragun on your face, but you need something that's good for you, something that that's healthy, that tastes good, and that's Built Bar. It's high in protein, but low in sugar, low in calories, and the improved Built Bar is even more delicious than before. 18 flavors, including six new ones like caramel brownie, cookies and cream, cherry barcia. Really like that one. Uh, Built Bar can also calm my sweet tooth because even without all that sugar, they're still coated in 100% chocolate, which I love. And unlike some protein bars, they're soft and easy to chew, which I love even more. So go to BuiltBar.com and use the promo code LOCK15. You get 15% off your next order. Again, that promo code is LOCKED15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. Real quick, before we get to uh, the other points we're going to talk about prognosticating the season and more Hillbilly Kobe talk, I'd like to do my quick DeAndre Jordan PSA, Brian. Oh, sure, please. Go ahead. I've already noticed a trend from Lakers Twitter, whether we're talking about people who cover the team, whether we're talking about fans who enjoy the team. DeAndre Jordan is already this season's Andre Drummond in the sense that every team every year, particularly with the Lakers, that has a very demanding fan base. And you know what? This, This is the price you pay when you've had this much success. Fans become, frankly, spoiled in a lot of ways that are the best version of spoiled and in some ways the most annoying. But DeAndre Jordan has become the polarizing player for this season. He's become the one that everybody has basically decided that they resent his presence on the team because they see him like the way they saw Andre Drummond last season as the reason Mark Gasol was not on the floor, the reason that all the chemistry on this team fell apart just simply because of DeAndre Jordan. Right. Uh, Ironically, uh, two Andre years Drummond. ago, that player was Rajon Rondo until the playoffs. And right, now right. Loves he was that guy, you know, Andre Drummond last year. Everything fell apart simply because of his arrival and the promise for him to start and that, you know, there was no context to any of it whatsoever. In fairness, this year, Rondo really know, was terrible in the regular right. season. 
Uh, this year, you can already see that is DeAndre Jordan and everything he does on the court, even in a game like Thursday, where on balance, he actually played really well. 11 rebounds in 15 minutes with yeah. six or seven on the floor, and I think it was like a plus 15. Was he brilliant? No. Was he like prime Wilt Chamberlain? No. And both of us, to be clear, have said we would prefer he's not the starting center. We would prefer that his minutes and his role be pretty limited. We would not be upset at the idea of him being out of the rotation. That being said, though, Brian, if he plays like he did tonight, you could do worse for guys that are really there to be innings eaters and glorified starters. Let's not turn DeAndre Jordan already into the thing that pisses off everybody from the yes. moment that he takes the court. Because if Here's nothing thing, else, I, I don't. Want, it is a good thing if it turns out I'm wrong about DeAndre Jordan because that means the Lakers have another useful player. Like that's good. Look, if he plays badly, fine. If he, you know, you can be critical of when he played bad. We've both been pretty clear. A lot of his preseason, he did not look great. Doesn't look good. But if you start looking to shred him because in of in your mind what he represents, you're going to make the entire experience way more miserable than it need right. be for me. Not even necessarily for you people. I don't care about you people. I'm talking about for me because in a lot of ways, I am all of your gatekeeper. I am your supervisor. I'm your babysitter. I don't want this. So I, yeah. I am asking you for all the entertainment we give you five days a week as your first listen. Let's not do this. Please. Yeah, I will say like the danger. I think what fans worry about is like that one game of 15 minutes, six or seven for the floor, 11 rebounds, plus 14, uh, you know, in the plus minus then distracts the coaching staff from five games in a row where the results aren't that good. But why don't we cross that bridge when here's we get the, there? Okay, here's the thing. Let me okay. tell you guys something. If this game sold Frank Vogel on DeAndre Jordan as the starting center, that's where it was going anyway. All right? This, this was just confirmation bias. Right, but so, then what you what you hope is that if there is, you know, in the face of other evidence that that would change. But I, I mean, look, I but yeah, again, let's cross the bridge when we get there. Okay. PSA. Um yeah, no, I appreciate you doing that because it was a very important message to deliver. Um I like I said, I have Andy kind of recalibrated what I think might I you know, I'm not sure they've got 12 and 3 in them. Um, if they do, it would be more based on sort of overwhelming talent, which would actually be a great sign, um, rather than any sort of continuity of which they've gotten zero in the preseason. Um, let's say they're eight and six, you know, you know, nine and six, something like that. Eight, and, you know, home heavy schedule, a bit of a squandered opportunity in terms of the overall record. Ultimately, how much does that matter? I mean, you know. I, I don't want to get worked up over something, but at the same time, you know, 82 games, they all do count in the standings and the idea of the idea of being a number one seed, while it may be less important to the Lakers, if you could take an advantage away from, you know, Utah, uh, take an advantage away from a different team. I, I'm all I'm, I'm here for that. Phoenix, whoever it might be. I mean, it they all count. It, well, I was going to say the the games all obviously matter. Like it, it, you know, they they all do add up. To me, though, I'm not looking at so much. You know, if they were nine and six, you know, which would be a letdown from the way you were hoping it would start out, like twelve and three, something like that. But you recognize that okay, it's because they played half of those games with two or three guys who were important, not available. I'm not. I'm not even talking about. Trevor Rees or Taylor Norton Tucker. I'm talking no, about like, like say, some Malik combination. Or, yeah, right. Kendrick Monk, Nunn, whoever it might be. Sure. Exactly. If you start looking at the extenuating circumstances, saying this is really the reason that they lost those games, they're behind the eight ball and getting themselves together, which was already going to be a pretty big task with all the new faces they have. I mean, in some ways, it doesn't make it matter any less because, again, it, the these all add up in the end. But it starts becoming less relevant in the way that you actually judge the team, right? Like the like the overall record. I think I, I think the, the 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 line there is: is there much of a difference between twelve and three and nine and six? No. Is there a big difference between twelve and three and six and nine? Yeah. You don't you just are you in a hole? Like the, you don't want to put yourself in a hole after fifteen games, and I don't think they're going to be in a hole. 
you could look at it and say Michael Thompson, who thinks the Lakers, you know, does the the uh, the analyst for the Lakers broadcasts on the radio, who thinks they should win every game, um, will look at you know ten and five and be incredibly disappointed. But that would be fine. Five and ten is the problem. Six and nine. So, you know, so as long as they're not in a hole, but it it would just be, it would have been a, a great luxury for them I mean, to be able to build up. Um, a, a really good record very quickly. It would be. I mean, yeah. to me, ultimately, though, the the why is going to matter more. Oh, for to sure. At one hundred individual agree. results, 100% because agree. because the why is ultimately what you know what mm-hmm. feeds the panic meter, so to speak. Let's do a couple minutes on Hillbilly before we go. Uh, Austin Reeves did not shoot the ball well. One of eight from the three point line. Uh, the one shot he did hit was a great catch and shoot from LeBron. Just you know, and, and what I and I actually texted you. I think after that shot and. Yeah, the the comparison is always going to be there with uh, with um, Caruso, Caruso because they're both you know pasty white guys who, especially when they came into the league. I mean, Caruso has obviously remade himself into some sort of Adonis, uh, but like when he showed up in the league, he wasn't built that way. Um, you know, and the but the, 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 he didn't have you know, that manscape money. That's true. <laughs> he couldn't afford weights. No. Um, but the one the the biggest knock on Caruso, and I think it was fair, is that. He he was offensively could be a negative, not because he didn't score enough, but when the open shot was there, the shot that needs to be taken inside an offense, he wouldn't always take it. Nope. Reeves takes the shot, and it might go in, it might not, but when you do that, you keep the flow of the offense going. And I thought on Thursday, if you can ignore the one of eight from three-point range, which happens to everybody, and look at all the other stuff, the extra pass, the pass on time, the pass to where it needs to be, getting into the lane and making dishes and things like that. Like I said earlier in the show, he made some passes that his teammates were not expecting because I don't think they thought he could do it. Um, he said, Frank Vogel said after the game that he's earned his trust, Not doesn't know how much he'll play. But with THT and Ariza out, I actually do think he's earned early season minutes and that he is going to play and that particularly, like we said in Thursday's show, if you put him on the floor with other members of the big three, you're going to get, I think, good minutes out of him because he always makes the right play. And it may work, it may not, but he doesn't do dumb things on the floor. I think they can get by with him just fine. Yeah, I mean, I, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens once, you know, Teams around the league are more familiar with him. They're paying more attention to him. They start adjusting to him more because something I talk about a lot that I always just find really interesting to watch every year, really in all sports, is with rookies, when they start getting adjusted towards how they adjust to the adjustments, Right, because it is generally far easier for coaching staffs to make adjustments for a rookie than it well, is for And in the NBA, particularly those- with veterans, it's more of a matter of, oh, I don't know who that is, so I'm not going to try. Right. And then well, they I mean, do something to make them look bad. And they're like, okay, now I'm going to try. It's not even so much adjustments as it is like effort. And, but you know what, though? That's, okay, if you want to boil it down that way, though, that's an adjustment, though. That's Absolutely. That's an adjustment sure. being made against Austin Reeves. I'm actually going to take this goofy-looking white boy seriously, and he has to do something about that. And that's something that I just – I find really interesting in For general sure. across sports – when when that takes place, it is though going to really help him. Though the the more experienced players or that he's around, the smarter of players that he's around. You know, both in terms of the guys that can benefit from the stuff that he does well, but also cover for the things that he doesn't. Like I, I still think, until proven otherwise, you're going to see teams picking on him. A lot. Well, I'm sure they will, and I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying he's going to he's going to be a star or anything. No, like no, no. That. I I understand I'm just he that. can competently play minutes. No, no. I, I I get that. I, I'm not saying that you're overinflating what he's going to be doing out there. I'm talking about the overall viability of mm-hmm. it. Like you know, because it's as as much as somebody like Mello will get picked on defensively. Mello is so much more experienced that you know if nothing else he can underst- he can understand certain things that he's supposed to be doing even if he's not doing it and then in the meantime you hope that he makes up for it with all the things that he is really really well established with on the on the other end of the floor or you know a guy like Wayne Ellington he's not a great defender but he knows exactly what he's supposed to be doing when he's out there you know when the game starts speeding up a little bit more and things start getting more complicated in terms of 
coverages on both sides of the ball mm-hmm. for a guy like Reeves who's inexperienced. I'm just really curious to see yeah. how he adjusts to it. That being said, though, I I am like I, we've discussed this. I am growing incrementally more confident with the idea of him being out there. I just think, you know, as much fun as the Hillbilly Kobe thing is, I think people need to really temper their expectations because, you for know, sure. I I want to I want to make sure I'm not make sure I'm clear. I'm not making a direct comparison to this other guy, coincidentally, white rookie with the Lakers, um, because I think Austin Reeves has a much better, well-rounded game than the guy I'm about to name. But Mike Penberthy, Mm. during his uh, one season with the Lakers, you know, he was a sensation for about about, a month. About a month. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, teams started really guarding him, really forcing him off the three-point Right, because he could do – but here's the difference, and because he could do one thing. Right, and once right. you took away the one thing, there was I, no I, other thing in the Yeah, I, I said that earlier. Yeah. I think Reeves is more well-rounded, no, but it's, and it's so the same principle. It is the same principle, but I think where, where the Lakers get away, and, and I think this is a talent that they have that they found with THT and whatever, where they can kind of find people who are just good basketball players but are kind of flawed aesthetically. You know, Reeves in the sense that he looks like he is from 1983, um, and you know, THT because he looks like he was put together on a night where God was high. Um, and guys with really good feel when that's their, one of their best talents, that is harder to attack. Like, it's not like, you know, you gotta compensate for a great crossover. It's like, it's just, they just are good basketball players. Sure. And so I, I think that'll help them hold no, up. We'll see. Department and, and, for this yeah, they may fantastic. need it because I don't think, you know, unless they bring in another player and it doesn't look yet like they're they're prepared to do that. Training camp cuts haven't happened yet. There's still time. Um, they're going to need him to play. Um, and so absolutely. And uh, he is I think he has opened some eyes as, as, to, as somebody who can be capable of it. Um, and it would be great for the Lakers, similar to DeAndre Jordan playing well. Um, all right. This is an interesting week. And Andy, next week they count. Yep. Tuesday night is the opener. Friday night, they're in Phoenix. Let's do this. I am excited. Like it, It's for real starting next week. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. We will see you then.